Welcome to the We Fucking Love Startups podcast. I'm your host, Troy Hammond, and on today's episode, we're chatting with Jessica Halley. Jessica is an anthropologist and a PhD candidate at Massey University. In her research, she's studying the intersections between the precarious labor network with gig economy, the digital workforce, and entrepreneurialism. It's a really fascinating chat, and I hope you like it. Kia ora. Thanks for tuning in to the We Fucking Love Startups podcast, brought to you by Talent Army. Did yeah. you know that what you were doing now was what you were always going to do? Or? No. <laughs> yeah. So I um, got a job out of high school um, working with people with disabilities in yeah. the community um, as a support worker. And that kind of introduced me to um, like – the kind of barriers that people have in life yeah. and um, particularly women yeah. and diverse women. Yeah. And so I kind of, that kind of started a bit of my own identity as a, as a feminist. Yeah. And I kind of felt like I, I wanted to um, pursue a career somehow in advocacy, but I, I didn't know what that would look like or where that would take me. So I, I did what <laughs> a lot of people do, which is go to uni when you don't know what you want to do, yeah, right? And yeah. it's obvious it's an expensive thing to do and it's not recommended, but um, it worked out for me because I I found um, anthropology. Yeah. And so, that, what, so let's yeah. pin that for a second. Yeah. For people listening and they say anthropology, mm-hmm. they're like, oh, what's that? I've heard that before. What is anthropology? So... A lot of people think it's the study of ants. Yeah. It is not. Yeah. <laughs> um, and some people also think it's the study of bones, which that is part of anthropology. But the anthropology that I do is is called social anthropology mm-hmm. um, and or cultural anthropology. So really it's the study of what it means to be human within the context of um, culture and kind of the contemporary world. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I found anthropology by accident and I was reading a lot of ethnographies, um, which is the form of research that anthropologists practice. So traditionally, um, anthropologists would travel like to remote places and live with tribe, tribal people yeah. um, for a year or more to learn the language and to kind of document their like gender structures, social hierarchies, their kind of local economies Mm -hmm. or everything about those societies, right? Um, And now we don't do, well, we still work largely with indigenous populations and and advocating on their behalf and trying to understand their plights. But anthropology as a discipline has broadened itself. So my PhD, um, I didn't go and spend time in the Amazon with a tribe, but I did go and spend time with developers, with software developers working in tech. And that involved learning a new language, I guess you could say, (laughs) because I had to learn computer programming. So, yeah. And so how does that tie, like in terms of your studies? Because most people will be like, I can see their brains imploding at the moment and they're going, why does that work? And so, like, how are you able to connect those two? Like, um, I think it kind of started, It was a, it's been a long journey and it was a journey that really started with my uh, master's research, yeah. which focused on, I had an opportunity, right, to do a research project which was um, about, which were focused on refugee, on the lives of refugee women yeah. who had arrived in New Zealand. It's the Bhutanese family. Yeah, Bhutanese yeah. refugees, yeah. And so I was, I wanted to kind of, I was unsure that whether there would be a language barrier or not. So yeah. I, I designed the project in such a way that I used some visual methodologies, which meant I, I gave the young women that, I, that were my participants digital cameras. Mm-hmm. And I asked them to um, make me a, a photo album of things that were Im- important to them about their lives and, and their journey. And I kind of had this really, um, I guess, naive idea of what they would photograph. I thought they would take photos of 
you know, maybe things that had travelled with them from Bhutan yeah. to the refugee camp and then ultimately to New Zealand. Or maybe they would take photos of, like, a recipe or, yeah. like, their mother's sari or, or something. Yeah. I had this kind of romantic idea that I was going to get these photos that I could interpret and they would yeah. be really kind of beautiful and abstract and all of this. Um, and when I collected the cameras back, what I got back was just a whole bunch of selfies, <laughs> <laughs> like, just selfies. And it was 2014. So it was oh, like, I love that. Yeah. <laughs> So it was just all, you know, when like duck face was yeah. a thing that everybody was doing, it was loads of that, like lots of duck face selfies. And so I had this kind of moment of feeling like, oh, like a bad scientist, like this isn't the, the data that I wanted, you know, like, oh, what am I going to do? You know, I've got nothing. I've got yeah. nothing for this project. And so I kind of took a beat and <laughs> took the weekend and, in that time, they added me on Facebook, the girls that I was working with. They friended me. And um, then I saw them posting the same photos on their Facebook accounts. And so the project transformed to being more about how significant, how important Facebook was for these young women. And it occurred at a time, it was a really interesting juxtaposition to be doing digital research because it was a time when Facebook had kind of peaked in 2014 and people were starting to be concerned about how big we were allowing this social media platform to get. Quite rightly, people were asking What's it doing with my data? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and turns out yeah, lots. not yeah, turns out <laughs> lots. Yeah. And then shortly after that, there was the Cambridge Analytica mm -hmm. data leak, mm -hmm. which caused a, a big backlash. And people also young people were leaving Facebook, right? So there was a lot of negative um, press about Facebook, I guess you could say, like not a lot of negative discourse about Facebook. And um these young women were just this tiny little insular bubble of minority women in Palmerston North, but Facebook was their world. Mm. Um, it was a way for them to reconnect with their rich social network that they had left behind in Nepal um, in the refugee camp, but it was also a way for them to kind of bridge the gap between their old life and their new life. And the way they did that was by through like a performative process of taking selfies and sort of experimenting with what it might mean to be a um, teenage girl in New Zealand yeah. rather than a teenage girl in a refugee camp. Yeah. So it was super special to them and it was just – what what that research piece did for me was it made me curious about the diverse ways we use technology and the kind of, you know, our generalizations about technology and whether or not they're true. <laughs> so I kind of, I really wanted to pursue a, a, a bigger research project that would fo focus more on on technology, but I didn't know what it would look like. So I kind of, I dug into the literature a little bit and I saw that within the social science literature, especially, there's a lot of research that focuses on how we're kind of consuming technology, yeah. what, what it's doing to the fabric of our how society, it's changing the world yeah, and, yeah, how it's changing, uh, how it's changing our identities, our yep. habits, our daily practices, all of that. But um, there wasn't much that hardly anything looked at well, what do the developers think? Yeah. <laughs> what are the people who are producing this technology think? Yeah. And so that's the kind of gap that I hope my project will fill. Yeah. And so yeah. why are the developers themselves, or when you said developers, are you talking about software engineers only or no. are you talking about people in the ecosystem? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, anyone who's involved in producing platforms and software and yeah. Yeah, tech. Yeah. Awesome. So, yeah, originally I wanted to start with the code, though. Yeah. So I sort of cast the net wide with this project and talked to a lot of people. And the feedback that I continued to get was, um, if you want to really understand this world, you kind of need to know how to code, right? Like you need to be able to 
has some no, credibility yeah, in the space, right? Yeah, has some right? credibility, yeah. yeah. So people keep um, uh, talking to me about Dev Academy yeah. uh, and Spiral Dev Academy. And so that's where I sort of, that was my entree into the world. Yeah. Shout out to Rowan. I think they're yeah, doing a fantastic shout out to Ron, job. He, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. A big, and, and a big participant in my research. And, awesome. Yeah. And for anybody listening who wants to, um, pursue a career in tech and wants to maybe change industries and doesn't know where to start, he's a good person to talk to. And yeah. Dev Academy is a great place to start. It's it's essentially a, um, like a placement on steroids. Yeah. Like a, yeah, it's... it's Real time. Real time. Yeah. It, it is a boot camp. Yeah. It's a lot of work. Yeah. And you, you have to learn quickly, but... Mm. And that, that was hard James for is, me. is about to go into it in a couple of months, aren't you? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Get programming now, like practice now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that would be my my advice because I didn't do that. <laughs> so yeah, and I, I'm you know used to being like quite a nerdy student and yeah. getting good grades and stuff like that. So it was it was hard for me Dev Academy because I um you know I'm I, I wasn't a good <laughs> I wasn't very good with computer programming or, or code. I was probably bottom of my cohort, but. Yeah. <laughs> It's okay. <laughs> but it gave you the, the yeah. skills and knowledge to be able to talk to developers a lot yeah. easier, I imagine. Yeah, it did, yeah. And so then tell me about your research then. Like, so if you can, can you break it down for us in a way mm-hmm. that people can consume it? Yeah. You know, regardless of how knowledgeable they are in the space? Yeah, yeah. So by doing Dev Academy, I kind of was able to then kind of fall into the wider and spiral network yep. where I sort of met a lot of young entrepreneurs. So essentially I've collected two key streams of data, which mm-hmm. is one is stories about computer programming and working with computers, and then stories about building a startup. Yeah. Um, so I have two kind of key streams of data that I'm kind of in the process of writing about in my PhD. Yeah. Right. And so yeah. can you can, like, can you talk us through what you're mm. hoping to see, what you're hoping to unearth? Yeah, sure. So I think the computer programming stuff for me is really interesting because it's you know i come i come at this with an with a background in anthropology right yeah. so when i first thought about what computer programming might be to me i i saw it as largely independent work yeah. people on their computers um headphones on black screen in front of them yeah. working, right? And I'm sure if you work, if you walk into a tech office, that is what it looks like. But by learning the skills myself, I came to see how dependent those infrastructures are on teams yeah, um, and how dependent the developer is on their relationship with the machine, i.e. the computer, right? Yeah. So it's a really intersubjective relationship there's a lot of failure that happens and the practice of programming itself is actually very intuitive. Yeah. And often in my interviews with um, developers, they struggled to fully put into words how they work. They had to use a lot of metaphors and stuff like that because... Like what, for example? Well, a big one that kept coming up for me was that, and I think this is really interesting, that time behaves differently around the work of producing software, right? So when you are making progress mm-hmm. um, in your in in, the, in a code base, time you seem I guess psychologists would call this state flow. Yeah, you sort of enter that state, and you can be there for hours, and it can feel like five minutes. Yeah, and it's a really kind of quite a meditative state to be in. Um, and the opposite can happen when you stop making progress, yeah. right? Time can freeze and you feel frozen, unable to kind of move forward in the program and kind of really isolated in that sense. So that was a big part of our discussions. And I think what that shows is that, you know, these, a lot of um, these infrastructures that we imagine to be purely logical yeah. are very human yeah. and and very, um, you know, there's software is written by typing hands yeah. on the other side of a computer, right? Yeah. And it depends on your relationship with your team and how many tickets you've shipped and all of that can influence your, your, your sense of self-worth in the job, I guess. Yeah. So, yeah. And do you think, so because like thinking about, 
is software good? Like, was mm-hmm. it so? With the, the starting point was like Facebook, right? Yeah, is, yeah. So, mm-hmm. is Facebook good for the world or not? Yeah, right? Is it yeah. take? Do you think developers have the opportunity to influence what happens with the softwares that they they're sending off into the world, like the individual yeah. developers, or do you think that they contribute to it? Or I think we need to have ongoing discussions about scaling technology in a way that's socially responsible, yeah, and sustainable. Coming at it from an anthropology background, I think it's really interesting, right, the kind of fears that that we have about technology. Um, And, you know, how we classify technology because it it always interests me how some things are classified as technology and then they slowly move or transition into being, oh, that's a household appliance, right? That's not a piece of technology anymore. It's a now and now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So like TV is a good example. When television first became kind of a household item, that was a kind of technology, right? And it was a technology that sparked a lot of fear in the public. There was people were suspicious of it. They felt deeply concerned about how much time it's going to take from us. What is it going to do to our social relationships? Is it going to stop people reading books? Like all these fears came about from the TV. And then, and I think we're seeing those similar fears about our phones now play out. You know, I think everyone feels a little bit like if their phone's not with them, it's like, you know, we're all a bit addicted to our cell phones. And if they're not with us, we feel like um, we've lost an arm. (laughs) So we're sort of as a a culture and as a society now renegotiating our relationship with the mobile phone, I would say. Yeah. Um, But that will pass at some point too. So I think when we think about scaling technology, uh, I think we need to think what we mean with it, like, really critically open up what what do we mean by technology and i would say as an anthropologist you know we can we can also look to the past to yeah. answer some of those questions so um one of the things that i like to draw a comparison to is um raranga which is the weaving that uh, maori do mm-hmm. um to make baskets right for the purposes of catching fish or and so that, that's a piece of technology that's still practiced now, right? And it has endured for 2,000 years. So I think if we were, if I were to talk to any of the entrepreneurs that I have interviewed, if I had said to them, you know, would you, you know, they would love the thought of their, their project, their piece of technology enduring for 2,000 yeah. years, right? That's the goal. Yeah. And so... We can look to the past for kind of role models and inspirations about that. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. think when we open that up, um, what that, what um, Raranga does is it, first of all, it solves a problem, yeah. a very basic problem, which is um, catching fish. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And second of all, it's used to, but socially to, to capture stories, to um, document um, ancestry. Yeah. So, it, so it has two key features to it, right? It has um, a, it solves a problem and it has it is socially responsible in some way. Yeah. And I think that's that's what a lot of um, entrepreneurs are wanting to do in Wellington. Yeah. Yeah. And so where where does it break down then, right? So like I think a lot of people, entrepreneurs in Wellington, New Zealand especially, are trying to do something good. Mm-hmm. You know, we have mm-hmm. some really like mm. you talked about the Inspiral Network. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. You know, use, like use case there. But there's there's like Carlos and the team at Carbon mm-hmm. Invoice, there's mm-hmm. Ben at Kogo and the like. So they're yeah. sort of doing some cool stuff now yeah. and there's lots of others. But is there a period where it breaks down and it becomes about capitalism? Mm, mm. Do you, in your research, have you looked into the, yeah. where the VC comes in and mm-hmm. things change? Yeah, and I think that's that's really hard. You know, that's true. At a certain point, people have to make a profit, right? Yeah. Unless you're trying to build a social enterprise. Yeah. You know, and I think you know one of the things we know about entrepreneurialism and what the literature shows us is that. Um, there's this ongoing feel, presence of insecurity, mm-hmm. like precarity. And that doesn't shift. So whether you're an entrepreneur in Mexico running a market stall yeah. or whether you're an entrepreneur working in tech and platform capitalism in the middle of Wellington, yeah. you still feel that same insecurity because it's culturally relative and it's personally relative. So I think we have to think 
we have to be kind to ourselves. You know, a, a lot of, you know, it's all very well to want to build a business and save the world at the same time, yeah. but that's a big ask too. It's huge. You know? Yeah. 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 And it's hard for me, like as a recruiter, yeah. I'll, I'll often get, hey, I want to do something really good for the world and really impactful, but I still want to get as much money as possible and salary. And I'm like, well, it's kind of, you got to choose one or the other, yeah, unfortunately. You, you know? do. And so we haven't got to the stage yet where you can get really well rewarded in a salary for doing these things. For doing these things. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think people are, I think one of the striking features of this time is that people are trying to imagine a world outside of capitalism, or I guess the correct term would be neoliberalism. Yeah. People were, for a long time, you know, it felt like there was no other way to be, right? Yeah. You start a business, you make your money, you get a mortgage, you get married, you have yeah. your kids, blah, blah, blah. Like those those guardrails for life, you know, they're not, there's no promise that, that especially for millennials, that you can achieve that life yeah. anymore. So I think people are unpacking that and envisioning a new way of building a livelihood, which is a really interesting So you're time. talking about the gig economy. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. So yeah, talk yeah. us through that because obviously you've been looking into that. Yeah, yeah. I've been looking a lot at the gig economy and like I think a lot of people now are grappling with um, insecurity. Yeah. You know, these times feel really uncertain and people cope with that in different ways. But one of the striking things about, especially the entrepreneurs I spoke to from the Inspiral Network, um, is that they kind of are deeply self-reflexive. So they often wrote, wrote about the, a lot of these things themselves. Yeah. You should check out, if anybody's interested, check out the blogs and stuff that Where they Where can produce. they find the blogs? Um, I'll give you a link. Open the show notes, yeah. 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 Yeah, but um, yeah, so there, pe- there's a lot being written about this sense of kind of insecurity. And I think if you are in the gig economy. What, what do you mean by the, so the, like, talk me through that, the insecurity. insecurity of being in the gig economy mm-hmm. by like feeling like, holy shit, I've got to keep doing this myself. Mm-hmm. It's like a little business. Is that yeah. what you mean? Yeah. Or not knowing when your next contract's going to be given yeah. to you, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Or trying to grow something from the ground up and needing the next lot of seed funding and not knowing if you're yeah. going to secure it. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. how do we get past that? I think we need to think about designing uh, an economy that allows people a bit more security, you know, whether that looks like a universal income yeah. or not. I don't know. I'm not, I, um, I don't have those answers yet, but I think... Um, Certainly for people who don't have a, a long-term salary, like a, um, a, don't, aren't paid a salary, yeah. life in New Zealand can be hard. Yeah. You know, it's hard to get a mortgage. It's yeah. hard to kind of do, to plan your life in a sense. And so I think we need to start as an, and it, and it can begin in tech, but it also needs to, this is a broader discussion yeah. as well. Um looking at ways of supporting um, the kind of inconsistent labour that we're seeing. And under a platform capitalist economy, we will see much more of that kind of labour. Yeah. Uber drivers are a really classic example yeah. of that, you yeah. know? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I agree. Yeah. I agree. Mm-hmm. And so, and like, so it was interesting. So like following the American politics, right, you know, um, who was it? Oh, I can't remember talking about the universal income, you know, that everyone should get paid. And then I wondered about that. So I spent some time really thinking and researching on that. And I wondered how much creativity would it give to the world if we could do, you know, if we could do what we wanted, you know, if we could follow paths that we chose, Chose. you know, instead of being pushed into. And so do you think, do you feel like the social anxiety that people feel is because of capitalism in terms of they feel like they have to go off and make money and do all these things and they have to feel that pressure or? Yeah, I feel that. And I also think, um, you know, there's a lot of, things that we're dealing with in our, at, at this time in the world. You know, climate change is a big anxiety for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, you know, nothing's promised anymore, I think. You know, um, the kind of, I guess it was like the previous generations had their university paid for them. You know, like they, yeah. they had kind of quite a secure life. You know, uh, they were able to get mortgages, buy, buy property, 
create a property portfolio. Many yeah. of the older generations in New Zealand could do that. Yeah. You know, those options are increasingly not as available to millennials. Yeah. And increasingly, it is millennials that we're seeing in the gig economy, and it is women. It's a lot of women. Yeah. Um, so I think... Why more women in the gig economy? Um, I think... Unfortunately, we do have, you know, there's a gender pay gap in New Zealand. Yeah. I think it's a st- structural it's a structural issue and also there's limited opportunities for women um especially to move in and out of the workforce with yeah. having children. Yeah. Yeah. And what do you think we can do better like as, in terms of the startup community in mm-hmm. particular? I I think um it's changing very fast. Yeah. You know, we're really empowering people to come back to work, yes. especially after kids. Mm-hmm. I I interview a lot of women mm-hmm. that have been off for five or six years yes. yeah. and they're so scared. You yeah. know, they're so scared mm-hmm. to come back to work mm-hmm. because they're like, I haven't been doing anything for five yeah. years. And I'm like, yeah. man, you've just got so much more diversity of thought yeah. and experience because you've yeah. been off doing that and raising kids mm-hmm. and you're going to come back and you're going to be fantastic. You know, yeah. But it's not until they get that first opportunity back that their confidence comes, comes back. back. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So mm-hmm. like a lot of the time they will do some sort of part-time contract work or something yeah. because it's their sort of easy yeah. way in. Yeah. But it's yeah. daunting. It's daunting for sure. And I think a part, big part of what we can do is start, um, and you sort of touched on it before, but start re, like changing the way we think about parenting, right? Parenting yeah. is a job. Yeah. It's a job. And yeah. if you can be at home with a toddler, you know how to time manage. <laughs> yeah. You know how to deal with difficult people. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So like, I think we should start celebrating that more on people's CVs. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah 100%. Mm. I completely yeah. agree. And and create an environment where women don't feel if they choose to stay home with kids for five years that yeah. it's going to impact their careers Yeah, because that's the thing that people get most scared of is they, oh, I've been out of the game for five years now. Yeah, no one's going to want me back. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Or like create worlds where they can be doing something or studying something or coming back slowly. Yeah, so, yeah. I agree. So what do you think, like, do you think Wellington has a unique opportunity in terms of looking at what we're doing here in the startup Absolutely. ecosystem? Yeah. Well, talk, talk me through that. Like, what yeah. do you see that makes Wellington unique? Well, Wellington is an, a, an interesting site to do, especially to do digital research, because it's um, a weird intersection, right? So yeah. first of all, it's a compact, ge- geographically, it's a really compact city. So, and the, and it's a city spotted with cafes. Yeah. So everything's within walking distance and there's lots of places to stop and have coffee, right? So yeah. that enables a sort of crossover between industries to happen. Yeah. Um, but secondly, there is this, and it's been specifically engineered since the 80s, this call to creative work, right, in Wellington. Wellington wants to be the creative city and it has very specifically branded itself as that. Who who engineered this? When did this? It was a particular book that came out um, around the time that, and I forget the reference, Mm -hmm. but I can put it in the show notes. (laughs) Um, It was around the time that Tony Blair was the Prime Minister. So um, he was trying to do that in London. Um, and it was it was a, a book about generating creative cities and yeah. this idea that work would would move, that the real, like the de- developed countries would have a lot of workers that were digital workers doing creative work yeah. and that that was going to be a lucrative market mm-hmm. in the future. And so Wellington wanted to jump on that bandwagon and it, and it very quickly moved to become a creative city and Lord of the Rings was a big part of that but there are other things too so I think part of what makes Wellington's flavor of entrepreneurialism really unique to me is the fact that we are also a capital city right yeah so there's this crossover between government and industry yeah that enables a sort of sense of social responsibility i think yeah yeah so it's a bit of a hybrid um yeah and i think what that produces is an entrepreneur that wants to not only build a business and make money but also wants to do some socially something socially responsible as well and so the ideal entrepreneur in wellington is somebody who can incorporate you know and i say ideal and 
speech marks, but yeah. <laughs> um, like somebody who can incorporate community values into yeah. what they incorporate the community into what they're doing, right? And have you seen good examples of that in Wellington? Yeah. Can yeah. you talk yeah. us through that? Well, Inspiral is a really good example. And when I was doing my field work with Inspiral, there were a few little businesses that were on the cusps. Um, I don't know if I have permission to talk about yeah, my yeah. participants on this, so um, I won't name the businesses. Sure. But I will. I can talk from my experience. I I did as part of my research. I um, did um, the low carbon challenge yeah. with a group of friends, where we ch- were trying to. I was sort of doing it as a researcher, but they were really trying to get this thing off the ground. So we it was like a. Um, small business challenge, I guess. Yeah. Um, and the other projects in there were everyone was wanting to build a business that could reduce carbon, help the public reduce their carbon emissions yeah. in some way. And it was an interesting time because we were, I was speaking with a lot of entrepreneurs who yeah. were really passionate and really deeply concerned about climate change, but also had to kind of make money on the side. Yeah. Yeah. It's an odd place to be in. And I think we need to question really, whether the market is the right tool to be solving these problems. Yeah. So the the thing I worry about with environmental products Mm -hmm. and anything that we're, you know, that is is pulling on people's heartstrings a little. Yeah, greenwashing is a big thing. Yeah. Is what happens now in a market that's going into a recession? Yeah. You know, and is that people now, like I look at products um, like Carbon Invoice that we've signed mm-hmm. up recently mm-hmm. too, right? It's a simple no-brainer for any mm-hmm. recruitment company out there you should be mm-hmm. using or any service company. Mm-hmm. But, you know, like the adoption I see in, in a year like this year that's going to be ahead is, is going to be lower because of, mm. you know, the economy and it's a problem where people only feel like they can contribute back to the environment or socially good products when they're cash rich from the last three years, whatever it is. And yeah. so, so how do we change that? Yeah, I think it's about making... Um, sustainable choices, easy choices. Yeah. Right. It shouldn't. That it's true. People, people do feel like they can, they can buy the kind of sustainable product when they've got money. But also that cuts out a whole group of New Zealand that just never has the privilege to, yeah. to, to be able to live a kind of green life. Like that's yeah. a very middle class position, right? To yeah. be. Um, able to to be able to afford for, to live to, a green yeah, life yeah to green life yeah. yeah and i think we need to just make it easier and i don't know if that's um a problem the market the free market can solve necessarily like i think what was interesting to me spending time with these entrepreneurs was you know what they were trying to do really reminded me of how you know unions would have operated in the 70s where if people would strike or people would have infrastructures to protest if something wasn't, if they felt there was a danger in the community, if they felt a river was being too polluted, if they felt, you know, there was, we had those kind of infrastructures in place and now we don't. Yeah. And so I think there's a need for that and we're seeing people try to create a hybrid where they're trying to tackle social, really important social issues, but also grow a business. And don't get me wrong, I want to see socially responsible businesses, but I think we should ask a deeper question about, well, is the free market really capable of solving these problems or yep. do we need more legislation around this stuff? That's the other. And what legislation do you think we could put in place? Well, I think, you know, the plastic bags, I mean, it's made a dent. Yeah. Not really, but, yeah, yeah. you know, like we can start. People feel good about themselves yeah, walking around with their red bag. <laughs> no, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You know, it's a hard one. I mean, whether we're talking about um, climate change or social housing, yeah. there's a lot of challenges that yeah. that we've that New Zealand is, is going to face. Yeah. And um, I think if we circle back to technology, I think one of the things we can do in the tech industry is look – at how we can think carefully about how we choose to scale our technology, the next generation of technologies. Yeah. And think about how we can scale it in a way that's sustainable and that's inclusive and So for someone that's listening to this, right? And mm-hmm. now and they're 
their whole career they've been focused on, you know, scale mm-hmm. and yeah, make yeah, money yeah. and you know, yeah. look good for the investors and boards. What does that mean to them? Like sustainable scalability? I think it means having good qualitative researchers on your team. Yeah. And I think it means having diverse people on your team, at yeah. least talking to people like from diverse backgrounds. The re- research they did with the refugee women is a good example of that. At yeah. the time, there was a lot of negativity about Facebook, but for this small pocket of young women, it was really important. Yeah. And I think we actually use technology in really diverse ways. And your socioeconomic background contributes to that. And so really understanding our users and being able to break down the kind of generalizations that we might have about technology and what it's doing and who's using it yeah. and why they're using it and what problems they have. Yeah. When we unpack those generalizations. I think that's that's the starting place. Yeah. Mm. And how, how do the researchers help in that stage? So I think um, one of the things we know for sure yeah. is that the next generation of technology, right, is going to is gonna already calling for more specific, personalised features, right, yeah. that's tailored to you. So gone are the days when you can do a one problem solution for the market. Yeah. That's out the window now. And we're sort of seeing that now with when you look at entertainment platforms like Spotify and yeah. Um, Netflix, they're kind of starting to make recommendations well, to you. Everything's an algorithm now. Yeah, for, for it's the an user, algorithm. Right? Yep, yeah, yeah, and that will bring with it its own fears from the public yeah. as well. People will be stressed by that and have their own anxieties about what their data is doing, and that's perfectly normal too. Yeah. But I think what we can a user researcher, that, and we've seen it with the uptake of the user researcher role, right? Yeah, and a decade ago that wasn't. That wasn't even a role. But yeah. now we're seeing more and more demand for user researchers. And what they can implore is kind of qualitative methodology, which involves... So break down what's qualitative oh. <laughs> methodology for people that sure, don't know what sure. that is. Yeah. So um, it's quantitative me- research is a lot of collecting data and yeah. dealing with statistics, right? Yeah. Qualitative um, research very much surrounds collecting stories and yeah. narratives. And to do that, you either need to spend time with people yeah. and or interview them or conduct kind of focus groups. Yeah. And you need to do that a couple of times. And then what happens is you start to collect a whole bunch of stories and then you code them yeah. and you see enduring themes. So, you know, that's how I'm able to t- talk so confidently about our fears from the 80s when the TVs came out, right? Because that was an enduring theme, an enduring concern that people had. Um, And so qualitative research is very much about collecting stories and flagging those themes that keep popping up over and over again because that reveals a a larger discourse within society. And I think those discourses are often surprising. They're often not what we would think. And they're often, yeah, Oh, they often don't pair well with our initial gener- generalizations. Yeah, and it's it's been really like as you say, right? Then the movement for the, like actual researchers, like yeah. UX researchers, not yeah. UX designers, no. they're actually just doing some wireframes. Yeah, yeah. People the actually going off and talking yeah. to customers and interviewing and, mm-hmm. and user groups has been phenomenal in terms of like helping to like product managers and helping engineers and helping everyone to have that voice of the customer in the room and have. You know, versus just the, I think this is going to be okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because often the solution is not what we yeah. initially think. Yeah. My fear is that we are too far gone in a world of capitalism, mm-hmm. right, mm-hmm. where it, we're in this theory of most people believe if I become rich enough like Jeff Bezos, you know, mm-hmm. then I can start giving back once I've got that sort of money and mm-hmm. being good for the community and doing mm-hmm. something like that or Bill Gates Foundation or whatever mm-hmm. it is, or or you can be crazy like Elon on, mm-hmm. on Twitter. Um, yeah. But what do you think, like how is it, can it be changed? I think capitalism as we know it, first of all, we have moved beyond um, capitalism and we're, we're in a, especially in Wellington, we're in what is called platform capitalism, right, which is a little different and that and it's and it's also a little scary because mm. it, that has the potential to create increasingly 
more insecure labour. So whether that be short-term contracts, yeah. people uh, um, stop getting permanent em- employment in various ways. So I think as a society, that's something we need to keep our eye on and think about how we can m- make people's lives more secure, whether or not they are living, you know, whether or not they have a, a long-term salary and long-term yeah. employment. Um, in terms of thinking like the dichotomy between capitalism and wanting to save the world, yeah, I think this is one of the ways that the market kind of, Karl Marx would say, this is how the market will seduce people, right? So yeah. people will start out with... Uh, um, a vision in their company that they and that that they want to do social good and that they're not going to get bored out and eventually the kind of luxuries of the high life mean that you you know seduces them into se- the seduces different you world. into hyper capitalism yeah. right yeah. um and i would also say that if we are looking at like your example of saying like billionaires and people like yeah. that um those people, I think, actually give the least <laughs> yeah. and do the least for the communities. So yeah. I do think we have a lot going for us in Wellington. Yeah. There are a lot of people that um, donate their time for free yeah. that that want to make a difference. Um, and so I think there's potential there. And and there, are, you know, it's an educated population and a city of really critical thinkers and artists. Yeah. So I feel like you can't pull the wool over people's eyes <laughs> when you have a a, a, a a city like that you know yeah. so yeah yeah i think i mean wellington's a fantastic place you yeah. know in terms of the startup ecosystem mm-hmm. um new zealand in general you know is a, is a fantastic yeah is a fantastic place yeah. but i think the um the nuance that you mentioned is the like I definitely feel that creative people tend to naturally want to work together with other creative people yeah. and formulate you know something together and yeah. follow a path and a mission and so yeah. you definitely feel like a lot of people in wellington will really get together to try and solve a problem for the for the, for the good, good of the problem yeah. versus for you know trying yeah. to make rich and famous and, and even a lot of um, businesses that might be you know competition with each other often come together to try to solve a bigger problem as well in wellington there is that kind of sense of are like ingenuity, you know, yeah. like the, the problem is bigger than us, you yeah. know, and egos. So I think, and I, I also think one of the key things about Wellington is that people, um, you know, they don't necessarily ask, you know, they they care more about your mission or your, than they do your salary kind of thing, yeah. right? That's a yeah. big part of Wellington. You don't see that quite as much in other cities, you know, like people might care more about your position or whatever, rather yeah. than your kind of integrity as a person. So, yeah. and and it's also a small city where you you kind of can't really get away with lying or bullshitting people here because where everyone knows everyone. Yeah. <laughs> so it's an interesting site for social science research for sure. And so, what do you is, is there companies around the world that you admire because of you know what they're doing and they're contributing? Or I do admire the people at Inspiral a lot. Yeah. You know that was kind of the focal point of my research um at times i felt like almost not worthy to be writing and researching about them because they are really trying to change the world and um i'm just sitting back and (laughs) writing about it you know so like i i found you know certainly um rohan and joshua val were a big had a big impact on me when I was yeah. doing my field work through that yeah. network. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's funny, right? Because like in Spiral, they've always had some amazing people in there. Yeah. Like I've always really liked Rahan. Like yeah. lovely, lovely guy. I haven't, um, I haven't had much to do with anyone else there. But yeah. there's like the companies that go in there, you, den- you the people, are the, the startups that come out of there generally have a purpose and yeah. like a passion. Yeah. Um, and then... Like so, you look at what Kogo is doing, for example, mm-hmm. right? So I, I believe that even that Kogo, even though they're raising money and growing and you know yeah. growing all over the world, they're planning on selling the company back to the original like um, investors and mm-hmm. not going out to VCs and trying to keep it as a yeah you know, a New Zealand one, you know, yeah. a company doing good. Yeah. And so yeah. there's definitely things you can do. Yeah. It's uh, the challenge that I think that we need to get our head around is. It is. It's harder to grow a company 
like that because you can't tend to pay enough or you can't do th- these things. And so like yeah. that's the, the, the way off, right? The, yeah. Not the, the balance at the moment. And yeah. so I just don't know how we go about solving that. I think there needs to be more um, – I th- I don't know if those are solutions that the market can solve. I think there needs to be more policy around making it easier for people to – start a business yeah. in this way in New Zealand. Yeah. And, you know, I think... Um, Easier or funded? Or like Yeah, there needs to be more seed funding available yeah. Yeah. for a start. Yeah. And I think just as a, you know, collective, I think, you know, the tech sector in Wellington needs to kind of embrace failure a bit more and yeah. embrace experimentation because I think... People have a lot of big dreams, but we don't often talk about failure. And yeah. doing that stuff, you know, trying to start a found, you know, create a startup um, and save the world <laughs> yeah. is hard. Yeah. You know, it's hard. And a lot of people fail. Yeah. But that's an emotive attempt. Like we, say yeah. t- we say attempt on this podcast, but don't yeah, say yeah. fail because we're trying to. Oh, we say attempt. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. No, that's okay. That's because <laughs> no. okay. I'm enough. just trying yeah, to. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. yeah I'm yeah, trying to get people intense. to start saying, just yeah. try, you know. Try, yeah. try. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I think. And we need to have more of that attitude. Like, of it. it's okay to experiment. Yeah. Yeah. But I think when you're trying to save the world and you're trying to start a company and it, and it, the attempt doesn't go well, mm-hmm. that's a hard emotive. Oh, huge. You know, mm-hmm. pit huge. for someone, right? Yeah. And so, like, I often see people like go out of the – like they leave mm-hmm. the ecosystem yeah. after. And that's really sad because they've tried to do something really amazing that was almost impossible, you know, yeah, or wrong timing, which yeah. is usually the, you know, the problem. Yeah. And so – but, yeah, I think uh, – I definitely agree. I think the mm-hmm. government should intervene a little bit more mm-hmm. with the startup ecosystem and support um, – Support people. people from the ground up. Yeah, yeah. doing – if they have the foundations and the infrastructure and the capability mm-hmm. to grow a company with mm-hmm. – a little bit more finance, mm-hmm. a little bit more re- structure mm-hmm. and not structure, but a little bit more confidence to be able yeah. to take on what they're going to do, then, you know, we're going to see more of these successes. Yeah, yeah. So, but I think it's starting to change. I think yeah. these companies now, especially like the mm-hmm. green tech space. Space is growing, yeah. Yeah, it's pushing mm-hmm. forward. And so pushing we're starting forward. to see that now. Yeah. And so, mm-hmm. I, I would like to see, you know, in the future, a UBI. I think yeah. that would be a big game changer especially for the tech industry in Wellington it would free people to be more creative and yeah. and take and take bigger risks be more experimental do yeah. things that they actually feel passionate about yeah yeah so I, I mean I, I'm really fascinated by UBI I've read, yeah. read a lot about it but for people that don't know what UBI is can we talk them through that for a second yeah it's a universal basic income and what does yeah. that mean it means that your costs of living are covered, yep. you know, for you to have a good life, for you to be able to afford, um, you know, the things you need for a really um, healthy middle-class life, right, in New Zealand. Yeah. So, you know, you can afford to go to the supermarket, you can afford healthcare, you can afford childcare, yeah. and you can afford to have housing, right? Yeah. That's kind of the, the necessities. And then you're paid that regardless yeah. of whether you have a job or not. Yeah. And so, you know, they've done experiments with UBIs around the world and what yeah. they find is they actually, um, you know, people end up doing things that they, it frees people to do things and it stimulates a lot of growth in the economy because people, you know, just from a fiscally point of view, if we take humanity out of the equation, yeah. it actually stimulates a lot of growth in the economy because it frees people up to to kind of, engage and um removes the fear of attempting yeah. right and and it remo- yeah exactly that's what it is so, it takes the barriers away yeah, yeah and so you can have a go at it right you can because just have a go. you've mm. got the safety net underneath you to yeah. take that jump you know yeah. for a shitty metaphor there yeah um yeah i like it i mean i'm a yeah. fan of ubi personally for but you know what what would what do you say to people that are like yelling at the podcast right now going you're fucking crazy <laughs> socialist hippie leftists you know like oh, well i am a socialist so yeah. i will say yes yeah. you're right <laughs> but um i think i would i would uh, ask them to look, research you know read about it cuz cuz i think this do you, is do you, do you think as a society though we're losing the ability that people are no longer researching right we're mm-hmm. just believing yeah. fact that yeah, we read yeah. on facebook yeah. or whatever it yeah, may be yeah right? that is yeah that's true and yeah. so how do we change that? Because that's the yeah. most important thing. Whether someone that's believes right. you or I mm-hmm. on something that we talk about or not, mm-hmm. how do we get them to think and then to go off and actually research? Well, disinformation is a really big problem. 
you know, on social media. Yeah. And I think, you know, people, it's it's very, I mean, I've seen it on my social media. You can easily find yourself in an echo chamber, right? Yeah. And the algorithms are programmed that yeah. way. And they're also designed to create, um, you know, po- polarities, like contention within people because that's how because when people are fighting on social media it drives to, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dri- draws people in right yeah. so I think that's something to be aware of um, I think one of the things we can do is you know in the tech industry is by is ensuring that we are surrounded by diverse opinions and voices right yeah. so like I think you know we have um like a lot of, for example, in Wellington, a lot of the entrepreneurs here that are building these businesses, they, they're able to do that because they essentially have some level of a safety net, right? Yeah. Whether it be a good relationship with your parents, yeah. you know, um, you know, you know, you're able to live in with at home or with mum and dad or whatever yeah. it might be, yeah. right? So there's a huge part of our society that that isn't afforded those privileges. Yeah. And therefore, can never take those risks. Can never dream of giving something a go. And I think we're missing a lot of potential there. So you know, my argument. <laughs> sorry, I think I've gone <laughs> off track a little bit. But to people who would say that I was a leftist hippie would be to just look <laughs> into it. And I think yeah. in terms of um, social media and the kind of contentions that we see online, I actually think sometimes we need to just unplug. Yeah. And I think we need to get better at actually legislating. Yeah. I know the free speech people would probably be angry with me about that, but I don't think, you know, we've just seen what's happened with our prime minister, have you know, who's had a woman in, yeah. in power and received more threats and than anyone else at, so far and has um, basically had enough. So I think we don't do enough to... Yeah. Um, mitigate what goes on online it is serious when somebody but power to her right yeah power to her absolutely she decided you know what i've had enough and i'm out good on her good Mm -hmm. on her so like for me i'd rather someone lead in the country that says you know like i call it a day i'm I'm calling it a day and she had a fucking hard ride hard ride right so i think um yeah anyone out there that's um wants to just be an asshole because she's a female leader you know Put your head back in the fucking sand. I agree. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Hey, well, um, fascinating topics. Like uh, I'm, I'm really enjoying this chat. Um, and so where do you go now with your paper? So talk me through like your PhD. What happens next? So I'm about to wrap it up. <laughs> Exciting. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have to um, submit it to a panel and do an oral exam. So basically that's where I defend my thesis. And yeah. it gets reviewed by experts three experts in yep. my field and then I have to defend my thesis basically and yep. you either pass or you don't. <laughs> yep. Like, well, you it, fe- either- it feels like a, a big climatic moment. Yeah, it's a pretty big moment. <laughs> well, yeah, it will be. Like yeah. I think it's one of the most serious parts of any kind of academics life yeah. like to do, you know, it's, a, it's an incredibly important oral exam that, I will need to do lots of meditation beforehand. Yeah. <laughs> but um, no, it's uh, you don't typically fail. Usually the options are you you pass with emendations, which yeah. means you need to go back and change a few things before they'll make you a doctor. Yeah. <laughs> um, or you just pass. So, yeah. And where to from there? Like are you, I would, you want to stay in research? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I'm interested in user research. Yep. Yeah, definitely. And I want to stay in the tech sector yeah. if I can. So I, I also feel I probably owe my children some time <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> since once I finish my PhD. So I will take some time to be a mum for a little bit. But yeah, I want to be a researcher in, in, in tech, whatever that looks like. Yeah, yeah where, where I'm focused on, on qualitative research and kind of capturing stories. 
Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I think yeah. um, you should talk to Optimal Workshop. That's something yeah. that they're building with their new platform now at the moment. Um, a lot of people have said I should talk to Optimal, yeah. Optimal Workshop. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cool company. I think yeah. well, I, what I love about where research is taking us now mm-hmm. is the importance of like the, the role of the psychologist coming in now to yeah. tech. And I'm like, yeah. wow, you know, like we're really yeah. actually trying to understand what our company is doing now and what our product does and how it's influencing and how it's how it's, you know, bespoke to a user, yeah, right? Yeah. A personalized yeah. is the word I was yeah, looking for. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Mm. yeah. Interesting. Cool. Well, yeah. hey, it's been really, really, really cool chat. I've loved yeah. this. It's been fascinating. Um, Thank you. I'm sure, yeah. I'm sure people will um, go off and read some show notes and try and understand <laughs> a little bit more about your yeah. research. Um, cool. And so the question I always like sort of mm-hmm. leave until the end of the mm-hmm. podcast, um, and yeah. I can see you nodding like you know what's coming now, <laughs> um, is what, what makes you happy? <laughs> Um, my, my children. Yeah. yeah. How old are they? <laughs> I've got a, a one-year-old and a four-year-old. Yeah. Oh, got wow. Two girls. <laughs> yeah, cool. And yeah, they're firecrackers. But yeah, I'm very, I'm very lucky. It's such a privilege to be a mum. Yeah. Have... What a cool place to bring them up on the coast yeah, in Romani South. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a great place. Yeah. Awesome. Well, well thank you so much for coming on. Thank and you, Troy. Yeah, have a great day. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Wow, I really enjoyed that chat with Jess. She was really fascinating. Obviously, you know, some really interesting food for thought there. The thing I love about podcasts the most is that when I listen to a podcast, usually it gets me thinking. And so I hope that one got you thinking too. Enjoy. This podcast is produced by John Otaka from Empire Films.